Good afternoon. Welcome to the FTS Bet Slip Wednesday, 13th of April. My brother's birthday in a couple of days. I must remember. Um, right, my. I, I feel like a broken record because I keep saying the same things. So it's been what I think could probably only describe as a bit of an unbelievable six months um, when I look back at it. Obviously, we've had two years of COVID when life was upside down and I was saying to everybody be positive um, I'm not going to lie I was an absolute broken man come um, Sunday I've just about had enough um, and I I appreciate that you put yourself in the sort of I don't want to say the public eye because I'm not in the public eye but you know you get responsibility to people in the betting world and I feel I'm letting a few people down just with things but life has just been absolutely unbelievable this last particularly the last four weeks but um it just, I've just have to. One, I'm totally exhausted with it. I'm mentally beaten up, um, and two, I need to get through it um, and and handle things in my own way for the minute. So, whilst I apologise, I make no apologies for that. That the next couple of weeks again are still going to be a bit bumpy for me. Um, we have had uh, Sam's brother have the heart attack when I was up in Manchester. We then had Sam's other brother have a stroke on last week. Um, and they're both in hospital both actually look to be doing better so fingers crossed and then Sunday night just completely out of the blue um, took the dog out and, and she just wasn't herself she just was laboured struggling to breathe got back in she didn't want her food and she laid on the sofa and she just seemed to be getting bigger and bigger bloating out um, that we ended up rushing her up to um, emergency vet hospital um, on Sunday evening and basically her heart had stopped functioning um, it was running at about 10% fluid was building up in her abdomen and uh, um, heart um, and I'll be honest I thought we'd lost her I'm not going to you know, get a bit emotional but um, I did genuinely you know all the vibes coming from the, the two vets there were that you know, this was pretty much curtains. Um, but they put her out Sunday night. They syringed half a litre of blood out of her heart or around her heart in the sort of sack around it and a load of fluid out of her abdomen. Um, put her on medication. We then had to go and pick her up at seven in the morning and take her to our vets because this hospital was shutting um, for the morning. Um, and they again just got her on the drugs and this that and the other and by some miracle we have got her home but um, she's not right we've got to see a cardiologist uh, next week on the 20th with her um, giving us some meds she can't be left alone got to monitor if weight and things in case this fluid starts to come back um, it may be a tumour that's causing it um, or it may just be I think they call it idiopathic which is basically I don't know <laughs> um, but yeah, I think on top of everything, it just did break me on Sunday. I was an absolute mess. Um, so I sort of thought, right, I've given my life to FTS. I'm just going to down tools for the bit um, and uh, get through this and deal with these things as they as they need to be. Um, and I am, in effect, going to do that. It's I can't just down tools, obviously. I, you know, I'm not going to let people down and not produce files. That, I, not being funny, that's how I feel at the minute. I just want to have a couple of weeks where I can give all this my sole focus, but I wouldn't do that to you. But other things will have to go by the way, so I'm not going to be doing Zooms for the minute. I'm not going to be um, dealing with people's individual stuff um, until I can get through this and get my head straight because my head isn't in the right place with it all. I'm trying to balance too many balls this end. Um you know, trying to trade the Masters, trying to get stuff out for the Masters, the Grand National, while all this was going on. Um, you know, I'm already thinking of Ultimate Friday, and I've got to do another one Monday. It's just all scrambling in my head that I've, I've got to be where I've got to be, family and home-wise, for the minute. Um, I mean, if we lost the dog on top of everything, I think that would end Sam as well. Um, so I've got everything crossed. It would break me, I'm not going to lie, because uh, she's a fantastic little dog. But yes, anyway waffling but thanks everybody for your hope i'm just telling people in case they don't know and if you're thinking why aren't i getting in a reply to my email or whatever um that's where i'm at i'm just having a bit of let's get this shit sorted and hopefully we can move on from it and nothing else happens um i can't think of anything else that would happen but it's just been an incredible bad people talk about bad runs in gambling don't compare to anything to this but we will get there
Um, so yes, bear with me is basically what I'm saying and thank you for all the uh, well wishes. As I always say, you are one of the reasons why I do this is because you are predominantly a very, very good bunch and I feel you're deserving of it. And um, you know, I wanna take as many people forward as I can, but I'm just gonna delay it for a couple of weeks while I get myself sorted. Um, so weekend, what, I can't even remember the last poll I did, probably was Scotty on Friday. Um, which then we did on Thursday. I can't even, I genuinely, brain is absolutely gone, um, fried. But um, yes, I was very bullish about Arsenal. Um, I don't know what happened. I don't know what's going on. Uh, the Palace result, I kind of excused it. Um, you know, people say I should watch them more. Um, I don't need to watch them. The odds tell me what should have happened. Um, you're talking about a team, Brighton, that can barely win a game and amassed 20 points and scored 18 goals since the first week of October. Um, it was just a terrible, terrible result for Arsenal, whatever way you look at it. Um, and Oh, well, never mind, eh? <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> never mind. Um, and then Spurs dismantled Gerard Ball um, on uh, Saturday evening. Um, got the goal early and then, yeah, rode their luck first off. I'm, I'm not going to shy from that um, Villa were, were in control and certainly should have scored two maybe even more um, Ings in particular was wasteful uh, from the free kick and the one at the at the post um, and Lloris uh, was outstanding and what I will say because people say oh yeah if you keep a, that is why he's there the keeper he is part of the team you pick 11 players and one of them is a goalkeeper uh, and that is his job. And and whilst Larice does have a clangor in him, and despite what Statsbet posted about him not being a top top keeper, he is a top keeper, particularly at shot stopping. Uh, other areas of his game, distribution of things, he's not so good at. But he has always been a good shot stopper. But ultimately, he's a player on the team, and he did his job. He is there to keep shots out. Simple as that. Ings is there to put the ball in the net. Um, and we basically saw one performing and and doing his job, and the other not. Um, and I totally agreed with the second half analysis. I just couldn't see Conti letting that, that flow of play continue in the second half. And it didn't. And Spurs got another and got on top and came out resounding winners. Certainly didn't expect them to win like that. Um, but they are scoring goals at the minute. Um, but, yeah. Um, yeah, lovely. Beautiful. Um, and I don't think top four is done. Just, I mean, I don't think, you know, Liverpool City was on, obviously, two all. Didn't see that. Um, but just as people are sort of saying that's done I don't think the top four's done I don't think the title's done all those four teams if we're talking about those involved Arsenal or Tottenham will drop points definitely and Liverpool City will drop points I do not for one minute everybody's saying oh they'll both win all their game I bet they don't um, they will both drop points all those four teams will drop points in the running it's just how destructive those dropping points are from here on in um, when they happen who they happen against um, but you know Arsenal yeah they've got to play Chelsea Tottenham got to play Liverpool all these teams I guarantee you will drop points um, might end up looking stupid but certainly I don't think the top two will win every game um, and I do think that um, Arsenal and Tottenham I still wouldn't call it they're both they will both Tottenham have got a clangor in them so you know as I say Villa could have been 3-4 up they weren't but they could have been um, and it will may well be that another game Spurs don't perform like that and do let goals in um, Chelsea out last night uh, again I didn't see it something, something nice about seeing them go out with a glimmer of hope rather than getting stuffed wasn't they sorry I'm upsetting them again another one I'll lose um, I didn't see the, apparently it was an absolute cracker um, I'm only going from what Twitter sort of speak um, I did see on Twitter that pass from Modric um, with the outside of his foot this morning. I, I don't think there's... Is there a better... Has there been a... Somebody talk about best free kick. Has there been a better player there outside of their foot than Modric? He really is genuinely a super little player. Um, what is he now? 35, 36? Um, he's one of the best I've had the privilege to see live. I used to love... Just just that was an excitement, getting up in the morning knowing you were going to watch him play. Um, brilliant. Um and then the Masters, good result trading wise, um, but an absolute bore fest for the third year running. Um, pretty much knew the winner. You know, 2020, we knew Johnson halfway out. 
Last year we knew Hideki going into the Sunday, um, and this year we've got um, Scheffler. There wasn't a, a moment after the Friday that he, I didn't think he was going to win it. Uh, not a moment. Um, it was a good result for me trading. I, I put him in the Friday preview, but you get all, your, all that tournament offers these days is a bit of excitement on the first day. A first look at a bit of sun and flowers, and that is it. Uh, I didn't watch Saturday. Um, I watched the Spurs game, and then I can't even remember what I did. Um, and then I had no intention of watching Sunday. Um, anyhow, before Izzy's issue, and I spent Sunday night up the hospital anyway with a dog. Um, good final round by McElroy, uh, and I said in the preview that I did. Um, that's what he does he shoots good rounds when he's out of it and that, that would be how I think he may win one I'm not sure he ever will win another one but if he did that would be how he does it and the others fall away after that um, but he shoots it when the pressure's off when there's there's a massive difference between being in contention and competing and shooting 64-65 to finish second third when you when you're ever never ever ever looking like winning it and that's exactly what happened um, and Sky, you know, they they annoy me with with that coverage anyway. I think they're terrible, but they they try and make him relevant. Um, I saw on the app. I opened up the app on Monday morning, and I mean, I couldn't actually believe what I said it. But they said, "What shot is better, Masters history? What shot is better?" A poll: uh, McElroy's bunker shot on Sunday. Or Woods chipping on 16 in 2005, like it's some sort of contest. McElroy's was to end a round that had catapulted him up a leaderboard when he's never ever threatening, uh, threatening a win. Woods was Woods had let a three-shot lead get cut to one. Was right in the mix of winning the Masters with three to play. The chipping restored him a two-shot lead over Demarco. He then people forget bogeyed the last two holes and ended up in a playoff where he beat Demarco. Um, you know, and if that chip hasn't gone in, there's a fair chance he doesn't win. There's not even a comparison. There's no. It's not even. I don't even know what's going on with these people. That doing it under the tensest of pressure with the tournament on the line, or you're in the tenth to last group out and you churn through the field because you're having a good last day when there's no pressure on you and you're never going to win it. Uh, just typical sky with everything they do over hype. Uh, I must. I, I imagine, and I genuinely didn't see it, but I imagine that the coverage of that round was excruciating you'd have had McGinley and Doherty probably trying to claim he still could win when he was four five six seven behind uh oh yeah this vital putt for McElroy if this goes in he'll have it all that's nonsense you'll have had um nonsense absolute nonsense just this this overhype and trying to create drama when it's not there noisy hell out of me um there will be a trivia question in years to come. Write this down, those of you who play the pub trivia machines. Which major winner four putted to win his first major? Um, I've never heard of it before. I don't. I, somebody might correct me, um, but Scheffler, you know, he, he won well. He's he's the hottest thing in golf, and and riding his form. Um, there seemed to be a trail of thought that I went with in the preview that you. This was a step up, and you just can't keep winning, um, and you end up looking silly afterwards. He's streaks ahead of everyone at the moment. Um, if it was, uh, you know, I sort of thought the morning after, you know, when we got Izzy home, uh, sat and sort of just reading through the sports news, that if it was a racehorse that was this far ahead of the game, you'd be lumping on. But with the golf, you tend to think, oh, it can't keep happening. Um, the golf guru did put him up at eighteen to one. I was pleased to see. Um, and I do take some consolation. I did win a nice, you know, one one a grand on him. Um, as I put him and Johnson as my trades in the morning, um, out of the top ten in the betting, they were the two that I said I think you'd be really unlucky if you didn't didn't at least get something out of that. You know, obviously I had Connors as well and East Shorten, but they were the two out of the top um, that I felt were the trades as opposed to people like Thomas Rahm who I just cannot see either of those winning round there I just cannot see it not for four rounds you know Thomas had a good second round but I just can't see them having the game for four rounds round there uh, but that will be a trivia question um, for years to come um, if you'd like more of those golf previews we'll see whilst I'm having a bit of a torrid time at the minute obviously everything will settle down it'll all get back to normal um, 
one way or the other. You know, life sorts itself out. Um, let me know. I'm, I'm moving more into the golf, and I don't mind sharing it and, and doing it. I'm not going to tell people every entry and exit, but if people would like a more detailed golf preview um, as a podcast, you know, I'm not saying every week, but most weeks certainly can do the majors and the big events. I've got no problem doing it. Again, I don't know whether people used it, didn't use it, paid any attention. I have no idea without any feedback. Um, and then we had the Grand National, you know, I said it before, but public thank you to Andy for what he did. Fantastic work again. Um, we will get a couple of race cards out going forward. Um, fantastic racing. I just love the race. I had Delta work placed, but the winner was fairy tale, wasn't it? Um, I see mutterings this morning of a big betting coup on it. I don't know how true that is. Um, I haven't looked, but apparently I think the BSP was like 29, was it? Is that right? On a 50 to 1 shot. Um, but just a fairy tale story that Sam Wavy Cohen winning um, when he started mentioning his brother who died of cancer nearly had me in tears I'm not going to lie um, but for your last ever race to be the Grand National and you win it is is something else um, but yeah you know for me my end the, the stuff Andy produced you know write ups pace maps just brilliant just to get an insight to what he does so thank you Mr Richmond for that um, and I hope people who you know good number of you had access to it i hope you enjoyed it or made use of it um and then finally then me me i don't know what they are forest and my second team i'm desperate for them to come out i'd love to see a joe proudly we will go out and have a party if forest come up i wouldn't mind seeing luton as well but i want forest to come up over luton but it'd be great to see luton back i'd like to see that stadium in the premier league um but uh, I see Wigan, who are looking to get League One now. My 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 new Wigan mates, my Wigan interest. Um, see, they were away to Burton last night, nil nil draw. Um, but Rotherham are just basically throwing promotion in the bin, aren't they? They got beat what th- well, they were three nil down when I last looked. I don't know whether there was any more. Um, and I expect that will be enough to see us crowning Wigan League One champions soon and back into the championship um, but they were playing Burton which reminded me I've meant to talk about this a couple of times that the Burton Albion mascot is actually an FTS member um, they have two mascots Billy and Betty Brewer He was, <laughs> this is brilliant he was originally Betty I was having a zoom with him and he told me this he, he was originally Burton Albion fan um, you know the family guy I think the season ticket holders uh, and he was originally Betty, but the guy who got the uh, Billy Brewer, so you got Billy Brewer, the male mascot, Betty, the female mascot, got the two of them. The guy, he was Betty. The guy who was Billy um, failed the DBS checks, which is like the, the uh, I can't remember what it stands for, something and barring service, basically to do with are you safe to work with children. Um, and so our FTS man got um i guess the word is promoted to billy brewer um i'll probably have some people call me sexist now why is billy being why why is being promoted from betty to billy a promotion but i'd imagine i might be wrong i'd imagine that billy was there first so billy so so our fts man he was betty we had a dbs check failure and he got promoted into billy so he now walks around the pitch in his billy brewer costume getting called a pedo every home game so all the away fans giving him pedo pedo um true story i'm not gonna i'm not gonna reveal his name on here he's a he is a cracking fts member absolute lovely guy um brilliant fts member uh but when he was relaying this to me i was in absolute stitches um, and I was disappointed to, to not wake up to news this morning that um, he'd gone and knocked the old Wigan mascot over as a bloke in a pie or something. Isn't it? I think Billy should have gone and got stuck in, stuck the old FTS head butt on a fucking mascot in a pie costume. Sort yourselves out. What are they doing in Wigan? Oh, let's have a mascot. What do you mean? Well, I'll dress him up as a pie. Flipping nonsense. Um, but yeah, so there we are. We've got both an Albion FTS member. Been, been a long time FTS member as well, as I say. Absolute. You know, cracking, crack, lovely guy. Just a top, top FTS member. But there we go. So if you're at Burton Albion Games and you see Billy Brewer, there you go. Ask him how his betting systems are going. Um, and then we have Boris, don't we? We have Boris. I will say on the end of this, I don't know what I've told you, there is a bit of mindset on the end of this. There's one of my mindsets tacked on the end. Um, I don't know what to say. All I've, I've, I've said it 
said it hundreds of times. I told you all in 2019. I told you so. Um, and and people are making me laugh. We're standing up for democracy in Ukraine and this, that, and the other, and we are watching UK democracy erode before our very eyes. Um, whilst under this pretense and proclaiming that we live for democracy in other parts of the world, it if it wasn't so disgusting, it would be laughable. But it is, it is disgusting. You know, people are so binary now, they'll defend it, whatever he does. I've, I've said it before, the guy could go out shooting kids in the street and some people would find a way to say it's just what Boris does and trot out bollocks. Every shred of UK's political institutions is being burnt to the ground around us by this, what are a morally bankrupt um, cult whatever you want to call them, and, and those who support it are equally culpable. They don't want to hear it, but you are. You are equally culpable. It is disgusting. It's immoral. It's tiresome. Um, I do live in a fear that nothing's going to change. The guy just lies perpetually, always has done all his life, been sacked in two jobs for lying. It's what he does. Um, and unfortunately, he gets people around him who just do the same, so everyone lies. It's just a real sad state of a affairs and and i've asked come on the pod please so anybody who wants to defend him please i beg you email me in and, and email me in and we'll discuss the defense because there is not one ounce of it that stands up to any scrutiny and then you get what about blair what am i going back fucking 15 years what about what about starmer um and his beer it's just what all i got is what about and what about it while the while the standard of british politics is lying in the gutter and i Except we haven't got an opposition. You know, that's half the problem. You know, I think there's still 1.75 to win the next election. It is it is staggering. Um, you know, sub gutter. All we can do is ensure they get massacred in the May elections and write to your MP and not accept the hogwash excuses. I wrote to mine within one minute of that being out last night. Um, call them out for what they are, and if you support it. You know, you are what you are. Nothing I say will change that. In, in the words of a comedian I respect, Billy Conley, anyone who listens to Boris needs professional help. Um, yeah, this just disgusting. It's 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 beyond disgusting when you look at what people went through. Um, it really is. It's just it's vile, uh, and and then just to stand and make light of it and pretend it's nothing and oh let's just move on and and the use of a war as an excuse you know i've said i hate excuses as an example using a war and other people's misery as an excuse it's just it's despicable it's, a, it's not much that i've seen worse it's just fucking horrific it really is and uh, you lot who support it just stagger me um anyway that's enough of that bloke said cardboard cut out cunt i've told you um, and he will always be one and if anybody thinks that he's got one fucking ounce and Sunak and Raab and Patel and Truss in you or the British public or doing things for the British public you're fucking mad absolutely mental um, anyway uh, as I say I'm going to be a bit quieter uh, home is very much my priority this period will pass um, but people will have to wait I'm afraid until it does before I, you know, I've given my life 15 years to FTS I'm just going to take a little step back for a couple of weeks and get these other matters sorted the dog business I really need to to hopefully fingers crossed get through that over the next week um, I just found it I've just felt exhausted I've been absolutely knackered with it all um, but everything that is essential will be posted uh, we've got two processes this weekend the championship applied twice so all that will go ahead as normal um, and then hopefully the dog will be okay Sam's brothers will be okay Sam will go off to Malta and uh, I can then take things forward at that time but pretty much for the rest of April um, if I'm being sort of honest I'm just going to be a bit quiet until everything is all done um, and I make no apology for it but thank you all in anticipation for understanding and thank you to everybody who's sent well wishes and things I, whilst I don't respond to them all I do read them and I appreciate it and uh, you know, as I say, you're a good crowd. Right, but stay on because I've now got a little bit of um, 
mindset and mathematics for you to move you forward. Um, and as I say, I'll, I'll do what I can over the next couple of weeks, but by May, I hope to be back to I know people say the season ends, but we've got loads of stuff and football all through the year, so don't panic. Um, Arriva Dirci, have a lovely whatever day of the week it is, Wednesday. In the last one of these, I spoke of um, getting started, focusing on one thing forward. Um, and I do firmly believe that it, you know, particularly if you've struggled, it's really important to change the way you do things um, from this point onwards. And I do, again, as I said in the last one, find that sticking to one thing um, and starting on that really will help. Um, you know, most people give up um, when the going gets tough, even if only trying to do one thing. So trying to do a multitude of things um, obviously multiplies that out and exacerbates it. But... Um, I'm convinced that the determination um, to avoid giving up is solely in the mind, uh, nowhere else. And and winding that forward, if you cannot then commit to one thing and do it properly, uh, I have no idea what makes people think they could do um, a second, third, fourth. Um, you know, it is vital that we we can train and learn ourselves not to give up. And and one way to do that, firstly, is to eradicate. Um, excuses you know and in all walks of life people make excuses um, you know, I'm a great believer in getting up early so I think you get up early you get up early get showered get ready to go you've got the whole day ahead of you then to be productive and work on things um, and um, oh I don't like to get up early and I go to bed too late well if you went got up earlier you wouldn't go to bed late it's because you're getting up at 10 11 in the morning that you're going to bed late you've just got your day out but once evening comes it's proven that people are less productive um, so you know again going back to a book I talked about the slight edge where you just move your getting up time move it forward five minutes a day all of a sudden you get up half an hour earlier at the end of the week do that for the second week you've got an hour at the start of the day you'll feel tired come 10 11 o'clock and then you'll go to bed at a normal time and you'll get into that routine um so you know I can't walk X steps a day I haven't got time again all that could be fitted in if we're getting up early reclaiming this hour now we've got half an hour we could go for a walk uh, I can't bet on Saturdays as I go to uh, football or I go and play golf it's always just excuses of a continual stream from people of why we can't do things quite often people say I can't do something before they even try to do it so it's the sort of their first thing out the bat is oh I can't do it um and um you know i think um napoleon hill who i can't remember the name of the book um but he wrote a book um one of the most successful mindset books of all time think and grow rich is it um and he says that in that i think he says success comes to those who have a success conscious and failure comes to those who are failure conscious um, an excuse making for me is a state of failure consciousness plain and simple um, excuses are the biggest one of the biggest things that turn me off people um, when they start making excuses um, and and what about her, you know is a, a which seems rife in the world these days is a is another form of excuse making what about this what about that you know it's just another form of deflecting away from doing something positive or taking action um so that last episode is a go away find one thing um have you i guess is the question that you need to ask yourself if not why not what has stopped you um and um as i mean as i stand today i've only had two pieces of feedback from that that last episode so i actually you know have no idea um you know i tend to i tend to form from an absent absence of feedback that it wasn't well received or didn't appeal to people um and that people don't really want to focus on one thing and make it work and that's fine um you know the two bits of feedback i had were very good feedback um you know it, we asked for feedback for to help us b build things forward for you guys okay i can't say it anymore and if if you don't tell us then i just write well you don't want our help that's fine and and that is absolutely fine it's not you know it's it's it gives me an area where i can put my time um and if it's not in that department i can put it into my own stuff and that's absolutely fine it's not a criticism of you guys it's just if we get feedback then we can do stuff with it and i don't need to spend hours putting stuff like this together i can focus on my own stuff um but if you have found one thing we now need to set a plan 
um, in that market you're operating, what you're going to do in that market, um, what is it you're doing, how are you going to do it, and that's the sort of stage where we should be at. at. That was what we talked about in the last episode. Um, what we want to do now is, is obviously we're going to forward test that on, I mentioned, a 30-day period, and we see if it tweaks it. But while we're doing that, we want to develop our confidence in what we're doing in that chosen activity. And to make a success of this, we are not going to stop until we turn it into the desired outcome we want. And that was exactly the process I went through. It will be hard work. Um, you need to promise to yourself, not to me, not to mates in a chat room, not to people on WhatsApp. Um, promise to yourself more than anything that you're going to succeed. Um, I will tell you now that if you talk and mix with negative people, people who've got this I'm better than you sort of attitude over you and like to feel superior um i honestly urge you to ditch them because you need to remove that out of your life um and i couldn't care who it is it can be your best mate whatever you just need to get every, every single negative incantation or step back that you get it will affect you and and it is impossible in life to be both positive and negative it does not work um you need to focus on positivity and what you're doing and and you know I, I say it many times what what really does that person add to your life um so in our in our one method then we are hopefully have identified or looking to identify what we need to execute in our method and i'm not going to do this for you um you know it's 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 something you need to do, what we need to execute, how we're going to execute it. And I think in betting, we seem to think that knowledge is power. I, I'm, you know, I'm a great one for doing, not, not just accumulating knowledge. And, 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 you know, we provide data. And I think some people just think that the more data they collect and look at, it will be the answer. I saw a thing a while back. What size is your database? Mine's 250,000 rows, as if it was a pissing contest. Um, I could probably achieve more with a database of 100 games than a lot of people can with a database of 20,000 games. Um, and, and we tend to think that this this knowledge is power and that by collecting this and following this the road, we'll become great at it. I'll tell you what you'll become great at. You'll probably become great at Excel, but you'll almost certainly, in a lot of cases, end up with paralysis by anal analysis. And I'll stress here, I didn't use Excel in any form at all in any form I checked back to see when I started it and when I took out my subscription I didn't even have it on my computer until 2014 um, I did seven years of this profitably very profitably six figure profitably um, annually using pen and paper I used to get up and those of you who've been with me a long time I used to get up at 4am on a Friday and use pen and paper to compile odds for 39 games over the weekend in the big leagues um, and I think um, you know it's one of them where a little knowledge is dangerous and just collecting data and crap doesn't mean anything um, the data doesn't make you rich uh, it should simply help influence what you do and the way forward um, you know it's how you handle yourself is, is what is going to make you a success um, of all this and I firmly believe that so what data am I using? That is that is absolutely key. Why am I using it? How am I using it? Um, and how accurate is it? And we've been through a, a sort of trying time, I'd like to say, on FTS. Big thanks to Alistair. Um, going back over four years of football, collecting all the data and checking its accuracy because we found we had some flaws in our previous source so we've gone back and, and basically rebuilt everything because that is really key that it's it's accurate um, but ultimately let's not clutter the brain with stuff we don't need you know standing there going I've got these great excel processes and I've got 100,000 4,000 million sheets um, I've got tons of Excel sheets. There's not a person probably in football trading who's got more Excel sheets than me. The facts are, a lot of them I don't even use. Um, and it is just collecting, but I've got the ability just to leave them filed to one side and not, oh, I wonder what that's doing, or I'll have a look at that, because that's when your mind starts to wonder. I focus on what I'm doing, and I've really streamlined what I do, even over the last couple of years, um, to what makes profit, what's fairly easy for me to run, what do I want to do, what fits in with me, um, all those sort of things. So 
let's not clutter our brain with stuff we don't need. Let's get into one method fully. So if we are going to focus, for example, on one and a half market, we don't need the three and a half gold data. We don't need the four and a half gold data. We can get that another time. We don't need it. Um, and then once we've got to this stage, so what data, how we're going to do what we're going to do, obviously we want to talk about how we build this trust in what we do. And, and probably the most asked question I have had since these podcasts started, you know, other than real basic stuff, um, how can I make a million or whatever, is um, how do we know when we start something? How do we have the faith for it to continue? Um, and I think once you go right around building something in the right way, then... In effect, all we do is turn it into numbers and then we can use maths to see if we have an edge to start off with. We can work out if that edge is lucky or mapped out through tools that are available. Um, and we could see when we have a blip in that method that is the arse falling out of it and that's when our brain gets twitchy, oh dear, dear, dear. Or the fact that the maths at that period in time are not playing ball. And the one thing I've learned, and I've even learned it this year, one of mine has had a horrendous run, um, one of my fixed one and a halves um, is that anything can happen. Um, but even in that time, something I some if somebody had asked me, I'd have said no, that cannot happen. But it has, but already starting to see it turn back the other way. Um, but you know, you the more you go through these processes, you learn things and you learn all the time. And to think that you know it all is wrong. We're constantly in a period of learning and looking at things. Um, but if we can turn it back into maths and numbers, that's where the faith comes from. It doesn't come from any sort of, oh, I know, or I get up in the morning and think there's a divine right to win. It's the fact of turning things into numbers, understanding those numbers a bit. So if we took simply a toss of a coin, heads and tails, um, and we, I stood in front of you and I tossed 50 heads on the trot, um, we'd probably get a couple of different views. One would think maybe the coin is... Um, rigged um, one may be think that uh, I'm cheating one may be thinking that the world is absolutely stacked against them and the correct people would think well that can't possibly continue it might continue for another 50 it might continue for another 100 but if you keep tossing that coin it cannot possibly continue because a 50 50 outcome will eventually over thousands and thousands of spins has been proven will eventually map itself out to pretty much a 50 50 outcome in results maybe not exactly but it it will not be far off from that um so that would be a hypothetical example and if and, uh, uh, moving that into a hypothetical football example if i was backing over one and a half goals and I'm, i am literally making this up i've got anything in front of me so if i get my maths wrong i'm sure somebody will correct me um but if i had a, a hypothetical one and a half system and i'm backing over one and a half goals an average five minute pre-kickoff price of uh let's say 1.35 pretty much a standardish type of price for over one and a half um and I've gone back and I've got a strike rate of, um, well, 1.35 is about 74, 75%. Uh, so the market's telling us we've got a 74, 5% chance of winning uh, over one and a half goals at that price. I have a strike rate on my system of 83%. So I'm thinking, okay, that's pretty good. I've gone running at 83% on something the market's only saying 74%. So that's a nice edge, I'm doing well. But then I might have, I don't know, 50 bets over a month and only 20 winners. So I've had 30 losers, 20 winners. So now all of a sudden, I'm only running at a strike rate of 40% against a market that says 74%. Um, I can quite easily conclude, once I know these numbers, I can quite easily conclude that the 40% has to correct itself. It cannot possibly continue for a market that you're back in, that a market price is 74%, that it can continue to run at 40%. It is impossible. If it did continue to run at 40%, the odds of 1.35 would never, ever be there. The odds would rise over time, and it would be fairly quickly, if this was happening, to reflect the new market strike rate, if you like. Um, so... I know that that cannot 
continue to run at 40%, but unfortunately people only see it as, I've had 50 bets, I've only had 20 winners, this is a load of shit and give up. Whereas if you keep going, that has to correct. There has to be a period. If we took the market, if we said we're just going to break level at the market price, it still has to get back to 74. For it to get back to 74, it needs to have a period in the high 80s. So there's going to be a good spell coming. It might not be in the next 50 or the next 50, but down the road, there's going to be a good spell coming to get back to this price. And that's when you're going to get your money back. But because we walk away when we're losing, because we don't understand the numbers and we just look at it, oh, I've only had 20 winners, oh, that's a load of shit, then we walk away. And and I think over my time of dealing with people, that's been the hardest thing to set people up for and try and explain to people and take them on that journey. And I kind of sort of said, now, no, I'm going to do it this way and you're either going to ride it out or you're going to give up. And if you give up, then that's fine. And off you go and leave me alone. But there'll be five or six people who say, no, I understand what's going on now. And I'm going to dig in and do it. Um, and, and that's, you know, and all that then comes back to, if we know that's going to go, if we've set ourselves up to be bomb proof, we know these runs cannot continue forever because it's maths. It's not an opinion. It is mathematics. It cannot happen. The odds would have to move. If things weren't happening, the odds would have to move to reflect it. Um, then I can actually com comfortably conclude using those maths that actually this is just a spell out of kilter. It is just a spell and it isn't that my edge has gone. Even if my edge had gone back to level with the market, it's still going to have a period where it comes back and it, and and it will there will be a good run. But as I say, unfortunately, most have given up at that stage because they haven't done that work in a in event and uh, pre-events. Um, and never get lost money back and that kind is the cycle that people go on because they just dive in have 10 or 15 losing bets um harvard study i looked at years ago i'm going back 2012 i think it was when i first talked about this um showed that people can't tolerate doesn't matter the event eight losers eight losers is kind of a losing streak you'd expect with um if you're betting at even money that could kind of be the expected longest losing run you have and once it get once you get beyond that uh, people don't want to know and it didn't matter whether it was blackjack spins of a roulette wheel poker hands it didn't matter eight was people's tolerance level really before saying i give up and i'll move on um and obviously in, in betting you space it out because you'll have a few losers win a few losers winner when you're on a bad run you don't just have continual 20 losers but you could drop down if once you put it into strike rates what you're running it and how it is then you can you can logically form opinions and logically look at it and logically tweak things to see where am i and that and that's again where people go oh i've had four losers on a thursday so they don't bet on thursdays anymore there's no logic to that it's just absolute you know it's, it's another excuse oh i'll take that one out because thursdays are bad so you know once we start to test learn the maths behind the odds and i do think everybody should try and learn the maths behind the odds a little bit so for decimal odds on betfair it is literally 100 divided by the odds gives you your percentages so 100 divided by 2.0 means the market makes it having a 50 percent chance and you can go from there 100 divided by 10 means a 10.0 it makes it a 10 percent chance so then you actually have an idea of what's expected and then your performance against that um so one of the next one of the next sort of exercises for you now having gotten this one method is what average odds are you betting at what is your loss per bet so if you're betting straight points obviously in one point you lose a point per bet and what is your average win per bet so once we start to get these numbers then we can start to formulate whether we can win or not um and we can look at the viability of of things and whether it suits us so if you're going to bet at bigger odds can you can you take on the losing runs that will come with that the bigger odds you bet at the the longer the likely losing runs so somebody betting odds of five and six is going to have longer losing runs than somebody betting at 1.3 1 1.4 uh it's just maths just absolute maths how it plays out um if you're not having enough success at your average win per bet to cover those losses then you can't possibly win so again uh, hypothetically let's say i've got a system i don't know 432 bits uh 314 one so what's that uh 118 losers so if i'm betting a point i've, I've lost 118 points so i've got 118 losers so there's 118 points there that are lost they can't be won they're there they're gone so i've got 314 bits now where i need to at least cover 
the 118 was it bets that I've lost and hopefully make more to make it viable to bet so I've got 118 losing bets 118 points gone 314 winning bets so I need to win out of that 314 I've got to win 118 points to break level so what's that 314 uh, divided by uh, 118 divided by 314 it's about 0.38 per bet so to break even my average winnings per bet winning bet has to be 0.38 points and that will pretty much cover my losers to make it viable for the work and time and everything that I want I'm probably going to need to win what half a point a bet so let's say 0.12 over what I need to break even um, so that would give me 340 157 points so I've now got 150 if I was averaging 0.5 win per bet I've now got 157 points of winnings I've lost 118 bets I can't do anything about that so now I'm 39 points up uh, the, the 157 I've won winning average 0.5 per bet less than 118 gives me a profit of 39 points net or round about what it's just under 10% around about 9% of my invested stake so I've won 41 I've, I've staked 418 pounds because I've had 418 bits was it 418 I said sorry 432 bits uh, I've staked 432 bits and I've returned 450 uh, 471 points 39 points profit so I've returned 471 points so it is round about 9% of of where I was at um, I'll, I'll put this in an article on the blog with the maths because I think it'll be a bit easier as I'm doing it off the top of my head um, but roughly yeah that's it it'll be round about 9% um, profit so I decide then is that enough for me that's fine um, something between five and ten percent it's fantastic so that's what i want so in effect let's just walk through that again i've got 432 bets i've lost 118 that's not going to change i've lost 118 points i need then in the remaining 314 bets to at least cover those losses or to give me a margin i'd be happy with to make it viable to take forward that actually is going to make me money uh, so i need to average for me just hypothetically round about 0.5 points per winning bet if i do that i return 157 points from my 314 winning bets i still lose the 118 so i end up 39 points up or round about nine percent of what i've put into everything uh, but i can only under do i can only do this if i understand odds percentages my strike rate my winnings per bet once i've got all that so so taking your one method that's what you need to look at and this is where decision making and knowing for example if you pick lay the draw as your entry you need to know what you're going to enter in what is your trading plan in that game and what is likely to be your likely profit if that trading plan plays out you know you're going to lose xyz if, and are you going to control those losses? Are you going to exit at 70, 75 minutes and control your losses so you know what you're going to lose per bet? And not going to, you know, that's where discipline comes in. We're not going to let it ride. We're not going to go another five minutes. We're going to control that. We're not trying to cover one day of good feeling. We want to be able to control that. And then what can we make on winnings per bet to make it profitable? And that is purely the process that you need to go through. And it comes with understanding the odds, the percentages, your strike rates, your winning per bets. So that really is your next step of what you're doing is to look at now what method you're going to go into, what market, looking at those elements. Um, and then from there, you can plot your bank. And then when your system is in this state of performance, you can see whether it's underperforming, similarly overperforming. If something was winning, you know, if my my system, that one and a half, 74, it was running at 90, 95%, I know that can't possibly continue. So I know a downturn is coming. I don't know when, that's the thing we can't do. But but over time, these percentages do play out. Um, and most importantly, then we can work it and tweak it and then you just take those same workings into another system and then another system and then another system and that whole thing becomes a little bit um, more maths and figures based as opposed to opinion, reaction, fear um, and I'm going to do a bit on fear um, based and, I, and I, I think the great 
sort of negativity and why people give up because they just don't know any of this it's just a great unknown and they just file it as oh i'm having a few losers this can't be any good um where we can actually pretty much work things out um to know where they are the mental battle of dealing with these runs still exists and we still have to get through those and that's a learned skill but at least we know the numbers behind it um so when sort of people say to me christy that's having a bad run yeah it is but it will have a good run because it has to it has to come back at some time um and it's keeping yourself in that game to do that and i think that's probably one of my skills um that others don't have anyway uh that's it so that's it for this episode and i will be back with a um another one in the future